At this time, let me introduce uh, Gunjan. Gunjan is a proud Pan IITian. He was the president and chairman of uh, Pan IIT USA. He's a graduate of IIT Kanpur, and presently he is CEO of Emirate Corporation. So Gunjan, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, really appreciate this. And uh, it, this is going to be a fun discussion, uh, uh, looking at the work coming out of the Jet Propulsion Labs, which is a NASA lab. And we have two fascinating speakers. Uh, I did want to alert the audience that the uh, polls are active. So if you are online, uh, please go take a look at the polls and answer the questions that uh, we have put up there. We'd like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, I think there's four questions. And uh, we are in Hollywood here in Southern California. So at least one of the questions has to be about a movie. And I will ask both of our speakers that question as well. Uh, so uh, please take a few moments to, uh, to look at that. Now, many of you might have attended the keynote speech by Prime Minister Narendra Modi yesterday. And he had only 15 minutes to talk, but I am so glad that he put in a plug for our session because he mentioned space technology and space startups in India. And then he quoted from one of our favorite uh, shows uh, talking about going boldly where no one has gone before, uh, which you will hear plenty about in this session. Um, you might also know some of you in the audience that uh, the topic we are going to talk about now is not the first time these things are happening. When, when ISRO launched the Chandrayaan mission a few years ago, aboard that, that moon mission were two American experiments and JPL, Jet Propulsion Labs had something to do with at least one of them. And that led to the discovery of uh, water on the moon. So uh, the collaboration between India and the United States has been going on for a while, but we are going to talk about two very new and very interesting things. One which has an IIT angle and one which has an ISRO angle. Uh, let me start with the ISRO angle. And about three years ago, I was speaking at an event called Select Los Angeles, uh, organized by the mayor of Los Angeles. And one of the other speakers at that session was General Larry James, who I think had just returned or was just getting ready to go to India to discuss the very thing we are going to talk about today. So we struck up a short conversation. And then I remembered that when we had this uh, pan IIT discussion and General James has been kind enough to give us some of his time today. Uh, Larry James uh, is an aerospace engineer and uh, then went on to get his master's degree at MIT. Uh, he was with the US Air Force for a number of years. And at the time of his retirement, he had 20,000 uh, people uh, at the Air Force working under his organization, having to do with, uh, uh, with ISR. And uh, let me see if I can recall exactly what ISR stands for. Uh, Larry, can you help me out? Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, I forgot about intelligence. You know, I left my intelligence at IIT. <laughs> so uh, it's great that you have an MIT connection because I'm a graduate of IIT Kanpur and IIT Kanpur was set up by MIT and Caltech. And Caltech, of course, runs NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs. So we have a good connection there. Um, I'm going to turn, uh, let, let's see if uh, the polls have uh, produced any results yet. Can, can, can you share the poll results if they're coming in? I guess our tech team is still working on that so we can start with the slides. So, so Larry, what I'd like to do is have you run through the slides fairly quickly and then we can get into our Q&A session right away. So uh, let me bring those up. All right, Gunjan, well, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And again, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, it's certainly a, a privilege to me, for me to uh, speak to this uh, large group that is focused on IIT in India and uh, really all that's going on in India with science and technology, and in particular for me, space. Uh, just a, a little bit of background. Um, I've been to India multiple times now. Um, 
in support of uh, the NISAR program, everywhere from Bangalore to Aminabad to uh, Trivandrum to Delhi to Chennai, uh, et cetera, uh, just uh, really in support of our growing relationship and in support of uh, this particular project, which is an absolutely essential project for both, I think, NASA and ISRO. So if we just go to the next slide. I'll just give you a little bit of background on NISAR. Many of you know about that particular mission, but I wanted to highlight some of the key things and key areas because it really is a very strong partnership, uh, you know, a, an equal partnership. And Gunjan, if you could flip to the next slide, uh, mine's not moving. I don't know. There we go. So just kind of highlighting uh, how we put the work together. First of all, this is a synthetic aperture radar. It's a swept synthetic aperture radar. So the beam uh, digitally sweeps across the surface of the earth. It operates in two bands, L band and S band. L band, as you can see there in the green provided by JPL and S band in the red provided by ISRO. Uh, ISRO is providing the bus, the satellite bus that we will put all of these payloads onto. And then uh, the radar instrument suite uh, which is a, a key component that JPL is putting together. So the S-band electronics will come to JPL, will install the instrument suite and put it all together there to create the payload. Uh, we're also providing the, uh, the large deployed radar antenna, as you can see, 12 meters. So I think this is the largest swept SAR uh, antenna that we've ever put up in space. And of course, the boom itself to, to uh, deploy the, the antenna. So that's kind of the, a picture of the work share. And of course, as you see on the left, uh, ISRO is providing uh, the launch vehicle of going from your, uh, your launch site there in the Southeast India on the GSLV Mark II. Uh, so we're very excited about that as well. To be honest, I haven't been to the launch site yet. So I hope to be able to get to go there uh, when we launch in early uh, 2023. So that's just a little bit of background. Uh, the intent is to really examine the earth from a polar orbit. And uh, we kind of have the tagline, uh, you know, studying the earth in motion. And certainly Gunjan, we can get into more details on that as we get into the questions. But you can see the ISRO centers that are involved uh, really split across uh, almost every key center for ISRO. Next slide. And again, I just wanted to highlight some pictures here, just showing you the cooperation. You can see on the right side, uh, the uh, S-band SAR radar electronics and system tests at Aminabad. Uh, so uh, a very important milestone for the program. Uh, that payload should be delivered to JPL here very soon. And then on the left is the L-band SAR system being constructed at JPL and going into the vacuum chamber. We've completed our environmental testing on that component. So everything is moving along very well. And we're about to reach the point where we get all the components together and start integrating the payload. Uh, next slide. And this is just uh, really to point out that this is an incredible team. Uh, obviously, this is JPL and really NASA's first major uh, partnership with India on a major spacecraft program. So, of course, there's a lot of learning that goes along, plus <laughs> just figuring out how do you operate when you're essentially 12 and a half hours uh, separated from each other. When do you have your meetings? Uh, it's long flight time to go to India. So just working out all of those details. Uh, it has been a learning experience, I think, for both teams, but I would say now we are a well-oiled machine in terms of integrating, working together, and uh, really bringing this whole spacecraft together to support uh, the needs of both uh, the United States and the world and India. So uh, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to end on in terms of just pointing out that um, it is a great team. We've been working together, and uh, it's coming together well with the payload coming together here early next. So with that, we can go into kind of the Q&A there, Gunjan, and uh, go from there. Thank you so much, uh, Larry, for, for that great overview. And I do want to mention to the audience again, please keep sending us your questions. I haven't seen them on my side yet. Uh, so we, this will be as interactive as the audience wants to make it. Uh, and uh, uh, also for the tech team, let us know when you can show the polls. Uh, Let's get going with our Q&A, uh, General James. So first of all, tell us a little bit about the budget of this uh, program of NISAR or NISAR. Yeah, um, on the NASA side, uh, it's about $900 million. Um, 
And on the ISRO side, I don't have all the exact numbers, but I would say uh, in terms of the spacecraft, probably about 300 million in US dollar equivalents. And one point I would certainly make is that you know, this is a mission that has been a high priority for the United States. And if you're familiar with how we do science, we have decadal surveys that define what are the priorities of the missions. And this has been a very pri high priority for many, many years. And frankly, NASA could never uh, receive the funding to put this project together. So the ability for both of our nations to come together, uh, fund their portion of the program, was really what allowed us to get this project going and get it launched. And it really goes back to 2011, Alok Chatterjee, who is a, a graduate of IIT, currently works at JPL, originally started at the Satish Dewan Center there, uh, but has really been at JPL over 30 years. He has really kind of been working this since 2011 to bring this team together, get all the agreements in place and so on. So. Uh, shout out to him as well for the great work he's done. And he continues to be the primary interface for the NISAR project with this road. Right, right. I know Alok well, and he's a graduate of IIT Kharagpur. And, you know, he's spoken passionately about uh, the programs that he's been involved with, uh, having worked both at ISRO and JPL. Yes. I think yeah. uh, that's, that's a wonderful uh, person to have on your team. Absolutely. Uh, so one thing I just want to make clear to the audience is that this is, not simply a matter of JPL outsourcing some work to, to ISRO. This is really a collaboration of equals where both parties are have certain responsibilities to make this happen. Uh, and, you know, uh, as an IIT, and I'm very proud of the work that IITians have done, but I do want to recognize that most of the engineers working today at ISRO are not graduates of the IITs. And a shout out to all of them as well uh, in contributing to India's leadership in the space program. And I'm hoping we can see our poll results. I want to, I'm really curious to see how many people have joined in who are not IIT alumni. Uh, we, you know, as IIT alumni, we put together the program, but it's really open to all, uh, both in the US and in India. Um, now, uh, I want to explain to the audience a little bit about what this satellite is going to do. I understand it's the most expensive Earth observation satellite ever to be planned and probably the most sophisticated. So it has so many different goals. Uh, General James, I tried to you know, study that and I was reminded of my years as a student, but I think it'll take weeks to really understand everything. So I'd just like to check check off a few items to clarify. So many of the satellites that you know, people benefit from every day uh, are geosynchronous satellites launched you know, 23,000 uh, miles above the earth and they stay over the equator at a stationary point. This one is almost the exact opposite, right? You are almost in a polar orbit. So just right. tell us a little bit about what polar orbit and um, sun synchronous orbit, what, what does that mean? Yeah. So um, if you wanna be getting a view of the entire globe, and I think if, you, if you've been in the space business, you understand this, uh, you wanna be going over the poles because you're in an inertially stable orbit, but the earth is rotating beneath you. So uh, as the earth rotates, you get a different view of the earth every time you go around about every 90 to 100 minutes. So that's the reason for the low earth orbiters, we go into a polar orbit from a weather or earth science perspective. You wanna look at the entire globe. So we, as you said, we're about 750 kilometers up. Uh, obviously, the closer you are to the Earth, the better resolution you would get with radars or cameras or whatever. So you want to be reasonably close to get the best resolution. Uh, and then we're in that 98 degree orbit, which again, essentially gets us entire Earth coverage. And the way it's designed, we cover the entire Earth every 12 days. So every 12 days, we're mapping the Earth with our L-band and S-band radar. Uh, we get a great picture of that. And then what we do is we fly over the same location uh, and essentially uh, use radar interferometry to see what has changed uh, from the time we last flew over to the time that we are currently flying over. And when you're using interferometry, that allows you to get very, very precise measurements of what has changed. Has the earth moved? Has the foliage changed in, in content or, or mass? Uh, and for movement, you're talking uh, down to centimeters and sometimes millimeters in terms of the ability to measure change. So 
that is the power of the synthetic aperture radar doing a repeat orbit and then combining those two measurements every 12 days to see what has changed. So that's, that's why we fly at the lower altitude in the polar orbit versus the geosynchronous where you're looking at one space and that's where the weather satellites fly. They're always looking at, for example, the Western hemisphere or the, or whatever to say what's going on from a weather perspective, but we want to have much more precise measurements. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now I noticed that ISRO has two different launch vehicles. One is called the PSLV, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, and the other is the GSLV. Uh, so my thought would be that they would use the PSLV to launch something into polar orbit. So, you know, as IITians, we look for these, uh, you know, these, these uh, apparent paradoxes, and it seems that they are using the GSLV Mark II. Mark II, I guess, because it doesn't involve any prohibited technology. That part I understand, but but why are they using the geosynchronous uh, launch vehicle? Um, my understanding is it's just mass. Uh, the GSLV has more throw capacity, mm -hmm. and this is a big spacecraft. So, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can launch on any azimuth you want to, whether you're a PSLV or a GSLV coming okay. out of the launch site, but uh, it's really mass. Okay. So the GSLV think... has the capability to, to get this uh, very large spacecraft up into orbit. And very large and very heavy, I think, translates to what about two and a half tons, if I if I remember. Uh, right? I believe you're right. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty big machine. Okay. Well, our audience is uh, putting up a number of questions. I'm going to select some of them. First of all, when will we see NISAR in orbit? Uh, right now, early 2023. Uh, so. 2023. As you might imagine, uh, we originally had a launch date earlier in that, but the uh, COVID pandemic uh, really impacted all of us. Sure. We had to stop work at JPL. I know ISRO had to stop work uh, working on the uh, S-band system. Right. Uh, and so uh, we've recovered from that. I think we're still not as efficient as we would like to be sure. in terms of the work going forward, just because we can't have everyone that we would like to have working in the space we would like to have them working in given the COVID restrictions. but but right now, uh, I mean, if everything was perfect, it could be late 2022, but we're kind of saying early 2023. Got it, okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the specific benefits that will come to humanity from this? And let me just pick a couple of areas. Uh, you know, uh, here in Southern California, we are under severe threat of fires at this moment because of the Santa Ana winds and the very dry conditions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, the work of NISAR will help uh, in that regard in terms of forest cover and fires and so on? Yeah, again, uh, you've got a radar, both L-band and S-band. And again, this is the first uh, swept SAR, L-band, S-band, dual band spacecraft. And I, I talked about biomass. So I would, I would equate that to understanding what's happening with the fires because with the L-band and S-band, we can look at biomass how, let's say foliage, how much the forest is compacted and full. And if you have a fire, that's obviously gonna be reduced. And so we can get a, a pretty rapid picture of the devastation caused by a fire, for example, because that biomass has changed. Suddenly, instead of you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of trees, I may have lost 30% of them or 40%. And now I can get from space a very clear picture of the devastation caused by a fire. Uh, and then uh, that will help us to manage how we recover from that. I see, I see, great. So one area that I think is shared, uh, a shared concern for both the, the United States and particularly California and India is the impact of earthquakes. Uh, here in California, we live in a seismic active zone and much of India, particularly North India is subject to earthquakes as well. And there's been a tremendous amount of construction in the last 20 years, and India hasn't seen a seven point something earthquake, uh, you know, in a while. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, how NISAR will play a role in terms of uh, seismic activity and monitor monitoring that? Sure. Uh, as I said, kind of our tagline is earth in motion. Yeah. So obviously, uh, as you all know, we all sit on tectonic plates and the earth is constantly moving. And again, uh, with the interferometric measurements, you can measure down to very fine grain detail. So one of the things that NISAR will give us the ability to do is see 
the motion of the surface of the earth at very fine levels, centimeters, potentially millimeters. And that's helpful for the uh, geologist to understand what's going on with the movement of these plates. So for us, for example, in California, the San Andreas Fault, uh, how much is the earth moving? Certainly we have ground-based systems as well with GPS that are measuring that in certain areas. But if you want a global look, NISAR is going to allow us to do that. So I think that's point one in terms of just understanding what's happening. Do we see rapid movement that we didn't have before? Could that be an indicator? And again, earthquake, earthquake prediction is kind of black magic these days. You can't really do it very well, but at least understanding the precursors is an important thing. And then if there is an earthquake, uh, understanding how the earth did move, also being able to map uh, major areas of devastation based on the change that we measure with the L-band and S-band radar and interferometry. And that will aid uh, disaster response also. So both those I think are important to both uh, the US, California in particular and India as well. Got it, okay. Now the two different bands, L-band and S-band are being designed, you know, one, one in the US, one in India. So will they be controlled by their respective uh, organizations or will the US have access to India's uh, radar and vice versa? Yes, uh, India will be operating uh, the spacecraft and uh, the data coming down. Uh, they were primarily gonna downlink the S-band into the India area, of course, uh, and then uh, uh, the US will downlink the L-band for their purposes, but uh, there will be joint access to this data. And you know this is uh, a global good, really. And so certainly the S-band from an Indian perspective, they're gonna focus most of their measurements on the Indian subcontinent and some, a few other areas that they're interested in. The L-band will focus globally. We'll measure globally all these uh, changes. But so you really do have two pair of powerful uh, regimes that will be operating, but the data will absolutely be shared. And there's multiple, you know, India has a downlink site. We have downlink sites that are handling these, frankly, large quantities of data, you know, like 43 terabytes of data per day that we have. 43 terabytes per day. Wow. wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is, this is a, you know, you talk about big data and being able to manage that. This is a challenge. This is one of the challenges we've had to deal with in terms of just designing the onboard telemetry and downlink system and the ground system and the ability to handle all the data. Well, later on, we are going to talk to Bob Balaram, who's, uh, you know, sending something to, to Mars, and let, let's see how many terabytes of data he can get in a day from Mars. Uh, it's not terabytes <laughs> from Mars, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, one of the questions that has come up, uh, and, and I want to preface that a little bit, I know many IITians who used to work at JPL, developed some great technology and then have gone out and uh, built their own companies in the areas of batteries. I know somebody has done that in the area of data and some GPS related work and you know, crypto and so on. So one of the questions is about uh, you know, the kind of startups that, you know, that might be spawned by the data that is gathered by, by NISAR. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a glimpse of, you know, what what could be possible? Yeah, I mean, um, again, this is uh, a unique data set with respect to global measurement of Earth change. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, I'm sure there's people thinking about it out there, but I think there's going to be a variety of, of opportunities to take this data and, um, you know, let's take biomass. I mean, if I can measure biomass very accurately and globally, I think there's value in that, uh, whether it's for uh, agricultural management, whether it's for farm management. Um, so, I mean, there's just a whole host of things I think that that data can be used for and that things that we haven't even thought of yet. But once the data is there and accessible, then it's developing the analytics and the tools to do something with it that, frankly, at the, turn, at the end of the day, you make money on. Got it, got it. Okay, now you used to work for the US Air Force for much of your career. And I know that there is tremendous military col collaboration that is happening between the US and India today. But from what I understand, this project here is a purely civilian project, right? There's no defense or military considerations to this at all, right? Right, I mean, it's, uh, you know, in the US, it, the, the Civil Space Agency, NASA is totally separate by law from you know, uh, Air Force space operations and DOD space operations right. and so on. So 
So we're totally separate now. I mean, obviously this is very useful data for a variety of purposes. So right. uh, there could be military utility in the data just to understand, again, if I'm looking at a particular area, I'd like to know as much about that area as I can from a military perspective, then this data can be useful, but this is a purely civilian program. All right, okay. Um, just looking at the audience questions to see if there's something we haven't covered yet. Uh, um, are there future programs planned uh, in terms of collaboration between ISRO and, and NASA that you can mention briefly? Um, I would just say that we're absolutely actively uh, working in that arena. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I've met with Chairman Savan uh, many times, um, and I know our, uh, our Office of International Relations at NASA is continuing to have dialogue. There's ongoing dialogues that happen. I know uh, India, we're having dialogue now in terms of signing the Artemis Accord, which is the Accords about, you know, our mission to the moon, the manned mission to the moon. Uh, and, you know, for Earth science perspective, uh, as I said earlier, the decadal survey that we do in the U.S. defines kind of the next 10 years, the priorities that we should look at for Earth science. And one of those priorities is essentially a follow on to NISAR. It's taking that set of measurements and uh, trying to develop them further, improve, bring new technology and so on. So, I mean, there's no guarantee that that would end up being a partnership with sure. India, but, uh, you know, we need to look at those things and say, yes, there's absolutely opportunity out there and there's absolutely dialogue going on about what those could be. Got it. Okay. Uh, are there a number of IITians working at, uh, at JPL that you're aware of beyond Dalok? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say right now there's uh, between 10 and 20 that I'm aware of that have graduated from IIT and, and come to JPL. As you said, some have come and gone and done, done other things, uh, but just a very strong relationship. And you mentioned Caltech. Uh, you know, there's a great presentation that Caltech does about the relationship with the Caltech and India and IIT back to the 30s. Uh, where the, some of the professors were over in India doing uh, gamma ray experiments with balloons. And uh, so just a, a very historical, long-term uh, collaboration. And uh, we actually have an intern program with IIST where we bring two interns from IIST to Caltech every year to get their master's degree. Right. And then they do a summer internship at JPL. And so we're trying to build those relationships, build that knowledge of one another, and I envision that, frankly, in the future, there will be more uh, folks from IIT here at JPL. Got it. Okay. Um, so, uh, I mean, my day job is helping Americans to deal with India. And, uh, uh, you know, I, in fact, I used to teach a workshop at Caltech on doing business in India. So hearing, uh, hearing you talk about the challenges of the time zones and the cultures is, is very interesting to me personally. Um, if there are students listening to this uh, talk uh, and students from India in particular, uh, do you think uh, there may be room for somebody from there to think about a career at, at NASA or at JPL? Of course, of course. I mean, Alok is a great example, right? Uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years at, uh, at, uh, in India and Israel and then came to the US and started working at JPL. So, yeah. uh, we are a very diverse and uh, globally diverse organization at JPL. We have people from France, people from Australia, people from India, people from Great Britain, uh, people from Germany that, that work at JPL. So uh, it's just, you know, what are the skill sets you have? What are the needs that we have? And frankly, are you uh, in the top tier of those? You know, we have about 6,000 folks that work here and it's a very competitive environment to come. But uh, I will tell you that the, uh, the Indian students that come from IIST to Caltech, I think last year, two years ago, the master's degree student was the top student there. So uh, you're doing very well. Great, great. So uh, let me ask one final question. Uh, as I alluded earlier, you know, what is your favorite space movie? Uh, you know, I would probably have to, uh, probably not too exciting, but, you know, I'd go back to the first Star Wars movie. I mean, this was, uh, I was, uh, you know, it came out, I was at the Air Force Academy. Uh, it was very inspiring. I loved space. And it just kind of gave you this excitement about space that uh, 
with the visuals that had never been done uh, that, that uh, you know, no one had done before. And it was certainly at a very form formative time of my life. So yeah, I go back to the first Star Wars movie. Awesome, awesome, wonderful. I did watch that movie. I was, it came to India back in those days. It took three years for a movie to show up in India. And I was working in Bangalore at that time. I just graduated from IIT Kanpur and I got to see Star Wars, the very first one, yeah. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Dr. Bob Balaram. And Bob, let me turn this backwards and start with what is your favorite space movie? Okay, yeah, even though it had a very major technical flaw, it's probably The Martian. I think uh, it, that's an example of problem solving that uh, is very much a, an engineer's dream. Uh, so that was probably my favorite, even though it, for dramatic reasons, they had a very significant technical flaw, which is that Martian storms would, you know, be that destructive, which they aren't. But other than that small detail, uh, just from a purely technical perspective, it was uh, warm my heart to see, uh, you know, all the problem solving approaches and building of systems that uh, got, got him out of there. And Bob, I would just make a quick comment because I've talked to Andy Weir, who's the author, and he, he knew that the storm could not do that. But he said, I had to have a plot device that would start the problem. So that's what I used, even though I knew the atmosphere would never topple the, the rocket. So right. and I think every, that he didn't get it right. Yes, and every movie, I think, is allowed one you know, free pass on something like that in order to... So as long as there's not so many that you sort of say, this is not real. So they picked that one, but everything else after that was so well done for me. And it's, it's an engineer's movie. Uh, right. And it was also a very good movie otherwise, too. Yeah, so I can imagine 10 years from now, because it takes Hollywood 10 years to make a good movie of this kind, that we will see a movie that uh, talks about a flight to Mars and, and Bob will be piloting a helicopter that goes from, you know, takes off from JPL and lands on Mars. I've already seen some flow of information on this uh, Pan IIT uh, thread that's talking about a helicopter that's already flying to Mars. So we let's, let's set that uh, straight a little bit. The helicopter is indeed on its way to Mars, but it's not flying to Mars. It's attached to the belly of the uh, spacecraft and will actually be dropped on the planet sometime in February. And then we will see Bob's magic start to happen. Is that Correct. an accurate yeah. summation or did I take too many liberties there? No, no, we are a stowaway on the Mars uh, Perseverance mission, which is a very exciting Mars JPL mission uh, to look for, you know, uh, evidence of life and collect samples for eventual return. And out of that very large uh, flagship mission that NASA is flying, they have been kind enough to, kind enough to let us uh, stow away as a technology demonstration. Right. And they're going to give us uh, 30 precious days on their calendar to allow us to do our technology experiment on Mars. Uh, you got that right, yes. So it's interesting that we are talking about it in this week uh, because uh, the big space news this week has actually come out of China where uh, you know the spacecraft that they landed on the surface of the moon is pick, picked up samples and is flying back to earth. So let me start with that question first. Uh, do you think there will be, there is a possibility sometime in the future, in the relatively predictable future that we'll be able to bring samples back from Mars to earth? Oh, yes, very definitely. The Mars Perseverance mission, which is on its way, is the first leg of a sample return journey. So Perseverance will be collecting samples. It will be sealing them in these pristine, biologically clean tubes. And then a, a future mission called the sample return mission. Uh, it hasn't been, doesn't have a, a fancy name yet. Yeah. So that will go and collect all the samples from the surface put them on a Mars ascent vehicle, send them into orbit for rendezvous uh, with a carrier spacecraft, and then that carrier spacecraft will return. And you will be able to do with those samples back here on Earth with your very sophisticated laboratory equipment. Even though Perseverance and all the rovers have had good science instruments, nothing compares to the buildings and buildings of fancy, good high-tech equipment that you can do science with here back on Earth. And those samples will be invaluable in really understanding, you know, what the conditions on Mars were as far as uh, life and uh, 
of the possibility of that, uh, yeah. that it was somewhere else in the solar system. So it's all exciting and all coming up ahead. And uh, it's just the first leg. Okay, so let's delve into the helicopter a little bit further. You're the chief engineer on the project. And uh, how, how many team members do you have wor that have worked on this with you? Oh, I think at, uh, at the peak level, we were probably had about 60 or 70 people, full-time equivalents, uh, when we were right in the major build phases. Mm -hmm. Right now, our operations team is probably down to more like about 10 uh, that will actually are uh, getting ready to develop all the command sequences and do all the rehearsals and you know practice all the particulars that we will be doing during those 30 days. Uh, yes, so it's been anywhere from a um, uh, peak of about 60 to 10, but the, when I say 60, you should also remember that many of those people were part-time. So we have had various people in all sorts of technical disciplines, not only at uh, the JPL, but we had significant participation from the other NASA centers and from industry that were all involved in uh, building this uh, vehicle. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the challenge uh, you know, of uh, designing a helicopter that will fly in an atmosphere that's just 1% of the density of Earth. Um, and let's start with the speed. I mean, is this, are the rotors running similar to what you might see here on Earth? Uh, no, they actually spin much faster. The, really, you have to move the air in order to get that thrust and lift going. So the way we do it is we spin the blades very fast, but there is a limit to that. Uh, uh, we don't want to get close to the speed of sound at the tip blades because that starts affecting the aerodynamics in more unpredictable ways. So we have a relatively conservative posture on the blade tip speeds. We go to about Mach 0.7, uh, 7 tenths the speed of sound. But that still means that our 1.2 meter diameter blade spins at about uh, 2,400 RPM uh, in order to, that's 40 times a second in order to bite into the Martian air and generate that lift. So that's been sort of the dominant challenge, um, you know, but there have been other uh, engineering challenges. Uh, first of all, in order to fly, you wanna make this thing as light as possible, you know, uh, because otherwise you just won't be able to take off. But at the same time, this very lightweight, almost gossamer-like aircraft has to survive all the rigors of getting to Mars. So it has to be a spacecraft too. Uh, it has to survive launch loads, launch vibrations. It has to survive the vacuum of space, the radiation environment of space. Uh, Mars gets extremely cold. Um, you know, we had expected to get to minus 90 degrees uh, centigrade at night. So you have the challenge of not only building a the first of a kind aircraft that would uh, you know, enable powered flight, but it also has to be a very durable spacecraft that can get there and, and function. So there's are two aspects to this challenge that are quite unusual. Got it, okay. So the speed limit of the tip of the rotor at 0.7 mark, that kind of sets an upper limit to how heavy your uh, helicopter can be uh, Correct. essentially, right? Yes, we had a certain limited amount of space that was available on Perseverance to allow us to conduct this technology experiment. So that basically set the blade diameter. So you look at the blade diameter and you see how much air can move through that swept volume of those blades. And then right. you have this constraint on the, uh, the uh, tip speed and uh, essentially end up knowing that you can't be more than about two kilograms. Uh, because you want to pre preserve enough thrust margin and so forth. So, and we ended up at uh, 1.8 kilograms, um, not 1.8 tons or two and a half tons like NISAR, but yeah. 1.8 kilograms. Okay. So what can you do with 1.8 kilograms on Mars? You put a camera on it, I guess. Well, primarily, this is a technology demonstration that is returning engineering data. Uh, we have done all the simulations, all the testing here in Earth chambers um, to Prove that this would work, and we are fairly confident that you know, we've got that all that right. But the real proof is to actually go to Mars and fly. And it's very similar to you know the little Sojourner rover that in the 1990s demonstrated mm -hmm. that you know roving was a good idea, a good feasible idea, and that paved the way for you know the spirit and opportunity and curiosity and now perseverance. So the whole focus is on returning engineering data, 
uh, how well did the uh, aerodynamic systems, uh, the rotors perform, how well did the navigation perform. Um, and so just look, essentially to validate the design. And once we have that in hand, we can then go about designing larger, more science oriented, uh, you know, helicopters for Mars. Um, Ingenuity, which is the name of this little helicopter is only equipped with a small color camera, very much like what you have on your cell phone. And that's just so that, you know, we can return some images, which will be kind of cool. But there is no science uh, in it, in no science objectives. It's all related to getting an engineering performance evaluation of the system. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about how this uh, aircraft will fly. Uh, so the drones that we operate on Earth, the unmanned vehicles, are can typically be controlled by a pilot or an operator of some kind uh, sitting at some some base, you know, somewhere on Earth. Uh, signal, of course, you know, radio and light signals take quite a bit of time to get to Mars and back. So is the rover controlling the device or software controlling it? Just tell us a little bit about how this will operate. Yes, so the, the helicopter itself is designed to be fully autonomous. Uh, all it's expecting from Earth is a sequence of waypoints in the sky. So basically go from point here to here to here, you know, and then the, the helicopter will fly through that trajectory specified by those waypoints in the sky. It's basically an X, Y, Z, heading type of uh, you know, specification. So the way we get those commands to the helicopter is we have a base station unit that's hosted on the rover, which serves as a relay between the commands that are generated on Earth by our operations team. They get radiated by the deep space network to the Mars orbiters typically, and then the Mars orbiters will downlink uh, those commands into the Perseverance rover. And then the Perseverance rover uses this base station as a relay to get those commands out there and then get the telemetry back. And then the telemetry follows the return path all the way back to Earth. So as far as the rover is concerned, we just look like yet another science instrument. There is a standard instrument interface that we conform to. Commands come in and they mysteriously get radioed you know, to the helicopter, if you will. The, the rover itself is completely unaware that it's got a helicopter. You just think that, some, that there's a in, instrument on board that's just behaving like any other instrument. And we have a radio link, obviously, between the space station that stays fixed on the rover and the helicopter itself. And that actually completes that last leg of that uh, telecommunications. And uh, what's the data have, rate? Uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead. What is the data rate you're able to achieve between uh, Mars and, and Earth? Oh, it's it's a few hundred megabits per day is probably the uh, you know the the limit. It really depends on the orbiter passes and what a lot of the data will also be taken over by other engineering functions on the rover. Mm -hmm. uh, but during this thirty days, so we expect to get most of the available bandwidth, and it's in the order of you know, many hundreds of megabits per day. Got it. Okay. The helicopter will detach itself from the belly of the rover and then make its first flight. How is it powered? Is it using solar panels or do you have a nuclear battery on it or? Right, so on the way to Mars, we are actually depending on the rover itself to provide us the, the electrical charge and the electrical uh, to keep our battery stopped up. So we actually have an umbilical line that comes right into the helicopter. And, and in fact, we have, every two weeks or so, we just top up the battery a little bit. But once we are on the Martian surface and detached, that electrical line is no longer available. Communication is to a radio link at that point. But then the, once the rover departs, you know, it drops us on the ground and it un departs, our solar panel gets exposed and we charge up our uh, batteries using our own solar panel. And at night, what happens to the helicopter? Is it, uh, does it land anywhere it feels like or does it come back to the rover or what? No, we, we're de very deliberately staying as far from the rover as is safe. So the rover will be about a hundred meters away anytime we fly. And so we have a plan to designate a certain airfield, if you will, on Mars, that uh, this being a technology demonstration, we wanna make sure that we have a very safe uh, area to take off and land. And so there'll be a nicely pre-surveyed airfield and landing pad. And we will do all the flights, um, test flights from that landing pad airfield area. 
And we, when we come back and lion um, during the night, the only thing we are doing is basically running a bunch of uh, electric heaters to keep ourselves warm through the Martian cold. And so we, you know, especially the batteries, uh, we try to keep them, you know, at a comfortable temperature as well as uh, some of the electronics which are derived from, you know, commercial parts. So that's uh, heater activity at night and a short, uh, up to perhaps two, three minute flights at most, but usually 90 second flights, um, you know, during the course of the day. Wonderful, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so if there's a young student at one of the IITs today, like you were at IIT Madras many years ago, tell, tell us which hostel you were in, uh, Bob. Ganga, Ganga hostel. For... The Ganga hostel, okay. So imagine there's a young kid, you know, in the hostel room that you were, you stayed in, in Ganga hostel, and he or she, uh, it would be a he if it's a boys hostel, but let's let's generalize it, a he or she as a student is thinking about, you know, what they want to do, you know, having been inspired by General James' talk and your talk, uh, you know, is it reasonable for them to aspire to figure out life on a, planet on, on one of the moons of Saturn? Is it conceivable that we'll be sending, you know, probes further out of our solar system? You know, what should they be dreaming about? Uh, you, know, you know, and uh, perhaps if you can tell us about what you dreamt about as a student, you know, that will kind of ground them. Yeah, so let me start with my own inspiration. It was really the Apollo program. I had an uncle, my mother's brother, who was very interested in space and he'd write to the local US consulate and they would send these thick stacks, what I now realize are eight and a half by 11, you know, uh, glossies. Uh, we do A4 size in India, um, which had all these wonderful information about, you know, the Gemini program and the Apollo program. And he used to get them and I used to devour them uh, as a little kid. And so when the moon landing happened, I listened to it on radio. Uh, television hadn't quite penetrated to our neck of the woods there yet uh, in India. And that was inspiring. And I think the, the really great thing now is that you have these global partnerships where there are a lot of people, whether it's for earth science or space science, there are opportunities now as a, you know, collectively, which we didn't have before. Uh, the technology has come such a long way that a lot of the missions that, uh, you know, you couldn't even conceive of, for example, the helicopter would, would not have been possible 20 years ago with the technology back then. So both the, the technologies, the ecosystem of, you know, uh, companies and opportunities is so much uh, vaster now than before that I think any kid in India can definitely follow their dream, whether it be earth science or space science or building things or operating things. Uh, I think it's wide open right now compared to what all of us had, you know, 40 years ago. Right. I think all three of us here are about the same age and I can certainly remember when I was uh, in, in middle school and high school, my father was a professor and we used to receive this tremendous amount of information from what was called the US Information Service, USIS. You yes. know, there was a magazine called the American Reporter and another one called the American Review. And you know, every nuance of Gemini and Apollo and, and all of those missions you know, was, was pouring into our mailboxes, our physical mailboxes for the young people on the, this call. We didn't have email back then. Uh, it's unfortunate, in fact, now that the United States doesn't have that kind of you know, devoted effort to promote all of the good things that are happening in this country. And I mean, there are people right here in Southern California, I think, who don't really fully realize all the tremendous innovation happening right here at JPL. Uh, in fact, I was looking at the ISRO website to talk about the flip side of it, and I had trouble finding information about NISAR over there. So, you know, in terms of marketing, I think uh, that's something that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, more of a cross-cultural marketing effort is needed. I did want to mention to the audience, though, there are a lot of technical questions that are coming up about both of these projects. And the JPL website is, you know, it has a boatload of information. If you go to, I think, nisar.jpl.gov, you will find you know, more information than you can possibly absorb. And likewise, if you look at the 
if, the, if you Google the, uh, you know, the term for the Mars helicopter or the Ingenuity, you will find tremendous bits of information. Even the name Ingenuity, Bob, can you tell us how that name came about? Yes, uh, it was, uh, the, NASA runs a context typically to the name the, the rover and the rover got named by Perseverance by one of the kids who submitted a winning essay. But there was another essay by an Indian American girl called Rupa. Uh, and um, she, and the NASA administrator said, you know what, this name, Ingenuity, and this essay is just perfect for this helicopter because perseverance to get us through this COVID and launch on time and, you know, get that done, most appropriate. And in some sense, the innovation and the sort of the sheer, you know, ingenuity that it took to build a helicopter. So both very appropriate names and ingenuity being selected by an Indian American uh, uh, young lady uh, in, from high school in, uh, on, in Alabama, I, I believe. That's awesome. That's a great story. And again, a great, great story for this week when Time Magazine has just selected for the first time ever, it's kid of the year. And the kid of the year happens to be a young Indian American girl, Anjali Rao. So uh, I think, uh, you know, Indian Americans are doing more than their fair share in terms of, uh, uh, you know, creativity, technology, and perhaps even a little bit of politics with uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. So uh, it's, uh, these are good times for us, uh, uh, you know, who were born in India and are now working here in the United States. Uh, and working in these exciting fields. Uh, so, uh, Larry, I have, uh, you know, you might have seen on the agenda, there were many quest many sessions around data and data science and AI. So, of course, people want to know how you're getting that 43 terabytes down to earth. And then is it being stored on Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure? And how are you processing it? You know, all the tech heads want to know. Yeah, well, uh, first we get it down primarily by KA band link, so pretty high data rate coming down on KA band. And then we are using cloud services. I won't you know, specify which one, but uh, this is really the first um, large scale data uh, mission that we're using cloud services to manage all of this. So absolutely. And, you know, I, in many ways, I have a mantra that I say, you know, it's all about the data. If we don't get any of this data back from our missions, no matter how well we construct the spacecraft, then they're worthless. So you got to get the data back and ultimately you want to do science and discovery with that data. So we're very much focused on managing large data, applying analytics, applying AI, applying machine learning. We've got multiple areas across the lab that are focused on that. Uh, yesterday we had the CEO of IBM, Arvind Krishna, who also happens to be a graduate of uh, the Indian Institute of Technology at Kanpur. And he talked about how both AI and quantum computing are going to play a major role in the transformation of society within the next 10 years. Uh, quantum computing as well is, is not something, you know, out there 20, 25 years uh, uh, out in the future. So it'll be exciting to see how the kind of data that you gather through NISAR will uh, you know will end up benefiting humanity through these new tools that are being developed to to analyze and and uh, assimilate that data and, and um, john i'll just say on quantum communication as well which is important in terms of handling this data we have some really world leading technology at jpl on uh, uh, you know super cool nano photon detectors where you can detect single photons and start to do quantum communication with that. We have a partnership with Caltech, partnership with DOE here in the US and a partnership with AT&T to yeah. help develop the quantum communication side of that as well. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about the human challenges of doing this work. And I want to ask both of you about this. Uh, let me start with General James. So, you know, you went through a transformation from a military career to more of a you know, scientific exploratory kind of role. So I'm sure that was you know, an interesting situation when you, when you are dealing with a bunch of PhDs, 6,000 of them. You know, and I, I should mention to the audience that you're the chief operating officer of all of JPL. So you know, six, you know, several thousand unruly PhDs uh, you know, are, uh, you know, are, are, are under your care and management. And I can imagine you know, how 
difficult a job that would be the, the heads of the IITs manage a number of PhDs, but not as large as you do, you know, so uh, for the directors of the IITs, you know, you're, you're actually dealing with something far more complex. But I wanted to drill down about the cross-cultural challenges. You mentioned the time zone difference between the US and India, and obviously that's a challenge. But tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, the cultural issues or the communication issues that might come up. And you can be frank, you're among friends. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, again, as I said earlier, I mean, we all approach problems a little differently. And we certainly on the space side, JPL has a culture of how we think about and approach problems and building spacecraft. And, you know, ISRO and IAT have a cultural approach to how they do it. Um, and so those cultures are gonna be different, but you kind of ultimately as engineers, we get together and we figure out, okay, what are the interfaces? How do we connect together? How do we do the verification and validation? It becomes a kind of a large systems engineering problem with culture as a part of that. And so you kind of have to take the culture component into account as you put all of this together. But um, at least from a JPL's perspective, and I know from Israel's perspective, I mean, you've got many, many international partnerships just as JPL does. So it's not unique in terms of the process. It's just now we have to understand the culture and how X, Y, and Z does business here. How do you do verification and validation? How do you validate the interfaces? Oh, that's different than how we do it. Let's talk about how we write something down that brings those together successfully. So we've been very successful at that. I think our teams are, it takes time. Uh, you know, you, it takes face-to-face -face meetings, really does. So our folks have traveled over there, your folks have traveled over here. Uh, but over time that gets built, confidence gets, confidence gets built, understanding gets built and you press on. And now that we've done it, uh, the next time around will be much easier. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so are there learnings there that you would share with you know, other initiatives, maybe at other NASA labs or other government agencies? Uh, the future we see here in the next 10 years is that the US and India are going to be collaborating much more closely together. Certainly on the military front, you know, relating to the threat posed by China that both the US and India are recognizing. And uh, you know, the, the uh, strategic uh, collaboration and the State Department and the US Department of Defense now refer to that region as the Indo-Pacific region. They don't no yeah. longer say, you know, Asia Pacific. They specifically added the word India. And that I think is a deliberate decision by, you know, DOD as well as the Department of State. And I fully expect President-elect Biden to take up that, that terminology and, and take it forward. So are there lessons that you would you know, if you were talking to somebody at state or at defense, and you know, we're gonna be working a lot more with the Indians, you know, what are the top one or two tips that you might share with them? Yeah. Well, again, first, let me say that, you know, NASA has an office in interagency international relations, OIIR, and I feed back into them. Whenever I'm in India, I'll write up a trip report and say, here's, here's how we did things, here's what happened. And that gets kind of captured and promulgated throughout NASA as required. So that's a good point in terms of making sure that the word gets out within NASA. Um, but, you know, I think just like any international relationship, if I was to talk to the, my friends at the DOD, and frankly, when I was in the Department of Defense, I was trying to build relationships with India. But this was, it was a little harder back then. This was yeah. the early 2000s and time frame and mid 2000s. Yeah. So it just was not as easy. Sure. But number one is patience. Uh, you, you just have to recognize that it takes time to build the relationship and to build the trust. Uh, and number two, uh, recognize that there will always be a different approach in terms of how you do things. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think we're amazed at how quickly Israel builds a satellite bus. Uh, you just have a great process, and, you know, and I've been in all of your facilities over there and frankly, they're a lot better than ours in many ways because ours are much older. Uh, you have a very nice flow of your equipment through the uh, test facilities. We have to move our equipment all over the lab because they kind of grew up over the years and they weren't really designed to flow well. Right. So, so those are the types of things that you just have to make sure as you run it, go into a relationship, uh, patience, build, build relationships, recognize that uh, the processes will be different, but then you figure out how to work together. 
Thank you, thank you. And Bob, same question to you. You know, you you've worked with a team of sixty people on the ground at JPL. Uh, many of them come from you know different nationalities and cultures, and I'm I'm sure from different disciplines because of the amazing complexity of this project. So when you have a material scientist arguing with a you know fluid mechanics expert, and they both know more about that subject than anybody else you know on the planet, and they're both right. How do you deal with that as a chief engineer? Yeah, so one thing I must give credit to my IIT training. Um, you know, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And that is a very important uh, thing to have in your head. Um, so specific to, you know, putting together something like ingenuity was um, having a very clearly defined goal does wonders for focusing the mind. Having a very clearly defined goal that has a very definite deadline, you know, we got to get on perseverance, you know, uh, otherwise you're not going to get this thing done. That also <laughs> wonderfully focuses the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and I think it does the same thing for the team. So I think that was the two key enablers that we had a very clear objective and we had a very clear timeline. And then, yes, it was a very adventurous path uh, with many a twist and turn and many uh, test failure and, you know, success. But uh, having that kind of focus, I think, lets uh, people, regardless of, you know, their differences and their differences in practices and cultures and styles and all of that, it allows everybody to move ahead uh, to the common goal in, in, a, in a time frame that's not too long, because sometimes having a too long a time frame tends to, you know, dissipate energy. Uh, so I think those, those were key elements, I think, uh, that helped us get to where we are right now. Right, right. So one, one thing I just wanted to highlight that you mentioned in, you know, in, in your conversation was the deep space network. So this is, uh, if I understand correctly, a set of, uh, uh, of uh, satellite communication, uh, ground-based devices all across the globe that are run by NASA, right? right. And uh, the deep space network for those listening in from India was a key component of the success of India's Mangalyaan mission. You know, when, when India launched the probe to Mars, you know, there was a lot of pride in India about how this was, you know, a dramatic success, which it was, but Indian media really did not report very much that the mission wouldn't have gone too far without the support of the deep space network, because uh, once the device left the you know, the, the, uh, the region of the earth, the only way for it to get to know where it was, was through, through NASA's deep space network. Am I paraphrasing that correctly, gentlemen? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we, uh, we had a, a long-term agreement with ISRO to support that mission. And as you said, uh, in general, once you get past geosynchronous orbit beyond the moon, the deep space network is the only globally covered network out there. We have sites in uh, the Mojave Desert in California, Canberra, Australia, and Madrid, Spain. So you essentially get that 360 degrees of coverage so you can talk to your spacecraft anytime you need to. And so, yes, we had a, a, an agreement with ISRO to support that both for communication and navigation, uh, just like you know we're supporting our current Perseverance mission on the way to Mars. It's, it was doing the same thing for ISRO and, you know, I can't remember if ISRO has a site in India that could communicate with MOM, but uh, at least with the DSN, you had the full Earth coverage that allowed the mission to, to operate. Got it. Well, there's a question here from my classmate from Kanpur, Christopher Flores, and he wants to know uh, whether either of you see a role for manned missions to Mars or is unmanned the way to go for economic and political reasons? And we know what Elon Musk's answer to that is. We'd like to know your answer. So what we are doing, you know, opens up that aerial dimension to Mars in terms of exploration, but we don't an an anticipate that you'll ever have large helicopters in Mars. The largest we consider is maybe in the 20 to 30 kilogram range is probably what's uh, reasonable just given size and uh, other issues. So we could be a good adjunct to any human exploration if and when it happens, but uh, we're not directly in that, uh, you know, business of flying somebody around Mars. But, but Gunjan, I will say that, you know, NASA does have the moon to Mars program, right? So the first component of that is the Artemis program, getting astronauts to the moon, understanding, you know, how we do that efficiently and well, 
And then there's already work going on with respect to the, uh, you know, the biological nature of how do you get astronauts safely to Mars in a radiation environment and those sorts of things that we have to think about when you have humans on board. So, uh, you know, NASA has a goal right now, of, broadly speaking, of, you know, getting humans to Mars in the early 30s, early 2030s. That could be getting to Mars and just orbiting on the first mission and subsequent missions land. So that is absolutely a part of the strategy of NASA itself. And as Bob said, you know, we're not in the human side of the business per se, but we provide a lot of support. We do a lot of the precursor missions. If you go back to Apollo, JPL landed the surveyors, built and landed the surveyors on moon, the moon to understand the environment before we send astronauts there. Now we've done the same thing with Mars so they can understand what it's like when the astronauts get there. So we do a lot of the precursor work that allow the humans to go forward. General James, is there something else you would like the audience to know that we haven't covered yet? Uh, there's so much material we had discussed, so I want to be sure that we didn't miss out anything that you consider important. Uh, no, I think we've covered everything, but I would just say that uh, we value the ISRO partnership very, very highly. It has been uh, very successful, and as I said, allowing us to conduct the NISAR development and ultimately operate the mission, and we truly do look forward to uh, many future endeavors. I didn't talk about airborne missions that we've flown together with, uh, you know, uh, visual and IR sensors over India and over the U.S. I mean, there's a lot of things going on beneath the surface, if you will, but it's a highly valued relationship. Uh, you know, frankly, India and the U.S. are two of the, the key spacefaring nations, especially democratic nations, and we want to see that future continue to grow. Awesome, awesome. Bob? Anything that, that you'd like to share that, uh, no, any highlights that we didn't uh, get to? Oh, we haven't shown a picture of the helicopter. Let me do that. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, very important. Sorry. Um, so while you bring that up, Kunjan, you know, I just wanted to say that, uh, yes, we are landing in February and approximately two months after landing, when the rover is fully commissioned, they will find a spot and drop us off. And then we should have a very exciting 30 days. So please come back in the summer time and see what we're up to. Yeah, yeah, great. So uh, when the landing happens, uh, when the rover lands, that's in February, right? Yes, February 18th, I believe. Okay. At that point, the ingenuity will just stay at the bottom of the in the belly of the rover and what will it be doing will it be warming up or no it's basically the first so many weeks is getting all the rover systems the rover at that point has to transition from having been an interplanetary spacecraft to a on surface mobility system so there's new software loads and checking and commissioning and check out of various just driving cameras the whole thing so once they get everything out of you know fully commissioned they will start driving and find us a landing pad, airfield area. Then they will drop us off from the bottom of the, uh, uh, the rover, go to a good standoff distance, like I mentioned, and then they will, we'll start our experiment. Okay. Is there any particular slide you want me to focus on here? No, I just, I think just, that's a good, that's a good uh, picture of, uh, that's the artist's conception. And okay. if you go to the next one, uh, it's, that's, what, that's the actual unit that's on its way to Mars right now. That's the actual unit. Wow. Oh, I understand what you mean by gossamer thin. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. So these are carbon fiber blades? Yes, and carbon that, fiber that... blades. And uh, there's the solar panel on the top. And right in the middle of the solar panel, you can see a little little antenna sticking out. Yeah, this uh, one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They are these are counter-rotating blades, uh, so that basically torque canceled. And just at each of the blades has a propulsion motor and servo motors that control the blade pitch. And below the blades rotor system, you have a fuselage box, which is basically where the batteries and the electronics uh, are. And down below on the bottom of the box, you actually have viewports for um, laser altimeter and camera to look at the ground. Uh, and then you have the, the four landing legs. So that is the way it's all set up. And we're all folded up uh, and tucked in under the rover right now but there will be a unfold and deployment operation uh, you know, after about two months. And that's when we get deposited on the surface. And at that point, we should look like the earlier picture that you showed where um, that's what it would, should look like on Mars. And just, uh, oh, just a few days ago, we actually would, did some 
dress rehearsal, rehearsal dry runs with a, a clone mock-up of the helicopter as well as the uh, ground test bed for the rover. So we actually have been rehearsing the drop sequences just over the last few days. So it's all coming together both uh, in space and us getting ready to do the mission. So do you have a vacuum chamber here in at Caltech at uh, JPL where you test this? Yeah, so all of the, this system was tested in um, vacuum chambers, which basically allowed us to pump down the vacuum, backfill the carbon dioxide to the Mars pressures and then validate and test all our flight dynamics that we could fly, we could control. Uh, we also had other chambers that we took this into where we subjected it to cold temperatures and vibration and shock testing. And then we also did a bunch of integrated testing where the uh, rover folks with us on board with the final flight units of everybody uh, went through a week long campaign of what the surface mission would look like. And we were deposited at Mars temperatures onto the surface of the chamber. So everything's been tested in a, some other test facilities. And now it's time to you know, test in the real environment. Okay, great. Uh, I think we are waiting for our host to come back and round up. Let me try and ask a couple of challenging questions while we wait for them. So uh, in uh, both of your missions have some degree of risk, right? So General James, uh, you're, spending a billion plus dollars sending this one satellite up. I remember that movie, uh, Contact, where you know the whole thing blows up on the launch pad, but the Japanese have built a second one that they didn't tell anyone about. And all of a sudden they have a, they have a solution. Uh, what is your recourse in case something goes wrong? Well, I mean, there's, very, there's various varieties of what can go wrong. A lot yeah. of times something can go wrong that we can fix with software, for example, yeah. or new ways of operating. So that's right. part one. You know, if you have a major failure, I mean, an example for us was our orbiting carbon observatory spacecraft. The first one we built, uh, the upper stage failed and we didn't get to orbit. And yeah. so NASA chose to invest in the new satellite, Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, which is currently yeah. operating. So, right. you know, it, it just depends. Yeah. Yeah. Bob? Did yeah, you have so, sleepless nights starting February? Oh, no, my sleepless nights started seven years ago when this project started. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we, we are a technology demonstration that fits the phrase, you know, high risk, high reward. So we are recognized to be have a risk posture that is not a flagship mission. We are meant to be this groundbreaking, pathfinding sort of animal that, you know, will check it out. And so we have done everything on our end on, with Earth testing and managing the risk that we have a pretty good chance of you know, succeeding. Not to say that there couldn't be a glitch. Uh, we are pushing the limits of some other technologies. But you know, JPL's motto is to dare mighty things. And I think in a small way, our helicopter is one element of that. Uh, sending up these wonderful Earth observing systems is another you know, aspect of that. And so you can't let that hobble your thinking, you have to move ahead and keep uh, and, you know, do the right engineering to minimize and manage all the risks. Terrific, terrific. Well, General James, thank you so much for taking time, you know, with us today, Dr. Bob Balaram, uh, really appreciate you doing this session today. I'm sure the audience has enjoyed this very much and uh, they have recorded it. So people, you know, it's past midnight in India right now. So uh, some of them who cannot join live will be able to, to view this uh, you know, later on. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, both of your time today. And uh, I will be watching closely in February to see what happens with the, uh, with the Perseverance mission. And then uh, in uh, uh, 2023, what happens with NISAR, these are both really exciting initiatives and a great way to showcase Southern California as well, where all three of us live. So thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Gunjan. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Gunjan. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Bye.